All righty. So hello, everybody. I am Gina, and I'm joined by Michelle. And we're going to be talking about the Endangered Species Act today, which is a perfect time for it because yesterday, I believe, was Endangered Species Day. Right on time. So first, we're going to go over a little bit of the history of the Endangered Species Act with Michelle. Thank you. So the Endangered Species, Endangered Species Act was created because a lot of unsupervised economic growth and development caused the endangerment and extinction of different species of fish, wildlife, and plants. And there were several events that pushed the public mindset for the government to protect the wildlife, which is important for a law to get successfully approved. So in 1962, Rachel Carson published The Silent Spring, which talks about the harmful effects of pesticides on humans and animals. In 1969, there was an oil spill in Santa Barbara where an oil rig ruptured and it led Nixon to create the EPA in 1970. The purpose of the ESA is to protect and recover imperiled species. And there are three key elements of listing, designated habitats and restoring healthy populations. When was it made? So initially the Endangered Species Preservation Act was passed in 1966 but it didn't have a coverage of immediate action, which means that it didn't prohibit taking endangered species. It only acknowledged selected endangered species and it did not protect habitats. So it was amended in 1969 and renamed the Endangered Species Conservation Act, which added a clause prohibiting sales and importation of species in danger of worldwide extinction. There were several other events that led to this, such as the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, created in 1970 by Nixon, and the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, CITES, was met in 1973, where 80 nations gathered to sign an agreement on prohibiting harmful commerce, such as the trade of specifically listed species. The ESA bill was introduced to the US Senate by Senator Harrison A. Williams. And due to the unanimous approval of the bill, it was signed by President Richard Nixon and Congress passed the bill in late 1973. And you can see the timeline on it right there. Okay, so now that we've heard a little bit about the history and the events that led up to the creation of the ESA, we're now gonna talk about the overview and what it does in summary. So what does the Endangered Species Act do? It seeks to protect and recover threatened and endangered species. So the definition of threatened and endangered under the Endangered Species Act is that an endangered species means that it is in danger of becoming extinct throughout all or a significant part of its range. And threatened is that it is likely to become endangered within the near future, within the near future, excuse me. And the Endangered Species Act applies to all plants and animals, unlike some of its predecessors that Michelle was mentioning. And it also protects subspecies, which is sadly poorly defined in the law. And so this is often contested, but it does attempt to protect subspecies, not just a overall species. In order to be protected under the Endangered Species Act, it has to be listed on its entire list of species. And new species can be added to this list through petition or through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or the National Marine Fisheries Service's discretion. And those two organizations are the ones that are mainly responsible for carrying out the ESA. The provisions under the ESA are enforced through citizen lawsuits, imprisonment, fines, and forfeiture. So for example, there is about, a, it can be anywhere from a $500 fine for a minor violation, all the way to $50,000 fine and possible imprisonment for a criminal violation. And here are the little logos for the organizations that oversee it. The, National Marine Fisheries Service is sometimes called the NOAA Fisheries Service. Um, okay, so 
There are currently 2,361 total species listed as threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act. And of those species, about 1,600 are in the United States since the ESA actually also lists foreign species. Um, but other than this National Endangered Species Act that we have, we also have an international equivalent of the Endangered Species Act that Michelle was mentioning before called CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna and Flora, kind of a mouthful, but that would be sort of the equivalent of the ESA that covers global endangered species. And it's agreement by several countries to regulate or ban international trade of species under threat. And the United States uses ES the ESA as the law to enforce this agreement. So as you can see, the giant panda down in the corner is an example of one of the species protected under sites and under the Endangered Species Act as a foreign species. Many individual states also have their own Endangered Species Acts, which can be more specific to their region, and it has less broad protections than the National Endangered Species Act. California does have an Endangered Species Act, and it lists about 250 species, and it is regulated by the Department of Fish and Wildlife. So now we're going to go on to what the Endangered Species Act actually does to protect and recover the species that it has on its list. So there are a number of ways that, ways that it protects species. One of them is by prohibiting something called taking of threatened and endangered species. And the definition in the ESA of taking is any harassing, harming, pursuing, hunting, shooting, wounding, killing, trapping, capturing, or collecting. So all of those fall under the taking term. And harassing can be any disturbing of the species, whether it's intentional or unintentional. The Endangered Species Act also makes it illegal to import, export, possess, sell, or transport any endangered or threatened species. Thirdly, it designates what is called critical habitat. And critical habitat is considered uh, any land that a listed species occupies currently or that is important for its future survival. Once they have this critical habitat, it is then protected from taking. It is considered a form of taking. And so you are not able to destroy that critical habitat that has been designated. The Endangered Species Act also prohibits the government from approving or funding any projects that might result in the destruction of this critical habitat. And so there are often permits that are required for different types of development projects if it is near or on critical habitat. Oh, oh, sorry. And finally, the Endangered Species Act also provides funding to states and territories to protect listed species that are not on federal lands. So those are all the ways that it, the Endangered Species Act protects species. Once they have the species under protections and listed, they then will create recovery plans for these species. And they're often ones that are threatened by certain construction developments. However, these recovery plans are often limited by the amount of funding that Congress is able to provide. So these plans will include basically a list of what is going to happen with this recovery. It will talk about the cost of recovery, how long it might take, what will be done, and a guideline for deciding when the species will be considered fully recovered. And these efforts often include habitat conservation or restoration, which we do a lot of here at OC Habitats, and sometimes even the more extreme measures of captive breeding programs followed by reintroduction. Um, and then these animals or plants that are recovered through their plan can be reclassified or delisted. So reclassified means that they would be listed as threatened instead of endangered if they are endangered. And delisted means that they're taken off the list entirely and they're not threatened or endangered. Species that are delisted are supposed to be monitored by state agencies for the next five years. And you can see up in this corner, we have an OC Habitats member participating in the recovery efforts of the snowy plover, a threatened species that has habitat along the beaches of OC. And what they're doing is placing protective cages over the nests to prevent eggs from being destroyed. All right, over to Michelle for a quick quiz before we go to questions.
Okay, so imagine you are observing a protected habitat of the snowy plover, which has been under protection by the ESA since 1993. So there are three people enjoying beach activities in the snowy plover habitat. Which one of the following are harming or harassing the snowy plover? A, we have a person playing beach volleyball. B, we have a person taking a walk. And C, we have a person playing with their dog off leash. So consider those options. Feel free to put what you think the answer is in the chat and we will get to the answer shortly. Okay, I'm seeing a couple C's for sure. A couple all of the above. All right, Michelle, what is the answer? <laughs> So the answer is all of them. I see a lot of you guys have gotten that right. And if they were to physically affect the snowy plover, then they would be intentionally harming them. But these people might not be trying to harm the snowy plover. They are unintentionally doing so by invading the snowy plover's habitat. So the snowy plover might need to move every time they hear or see something strange. So it will be disturbed. It is right to stay out of designated areas protecting endangered species and to keep your pets on leash, especially at the beach. Awesome. So after that, we have a break for any questions or discussions that people want to have before we go into the second half of our presentation. So feel free to put your questions in the chat or you can now unmute and turn on your camera if you want to discuss with us. Now is the time to do so. So any questions you might have, we would love to answer. I'm wondering who has the sort of enforcement authority for sites. So I believe that sites is enforced by the individual com countries that agreed oh. to it. So they'll all say they'll all put a ban on international trade of those specific species is I believe how it works. So countries that aren't signatories to it could be causing a lot of issues. Yes. Yeah. If they haven't agreed to it, then yes. Gina, do you know on the sites program um, like who from all, each country goes there? Is there an ambassador? Is it the head of the endangered species, um, you know, department? Who 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 are the people who make our, those decisions in that group? Did they? Did you get into deep that in, deep into it? I am not sure who goes. I also don't know if they like how often it would meet. They might just have like met and then agreed to it and not have to meet super frequently. Um, I can try to find that, but yeah, I'm not sure who goes. I, have a, um, I, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, I do have a question about critical habitat. Did, did you find anything about how, um, I know that it says that they designate critical habitat as the species uses it or they th think the species needs it. How did they determine um, and maybe you didn't find this out because it's probably a pretty specific question, but how do they determine the parameters of that? Like, you know, oh, this is the box. You know, why doesn't it extend past the box or why is the box as big as it is? Did they, did you get into any of that? Well, you're right. It is a pretty like complicated thing. And I think it's often pretty, um, like the lines are pretty blurry on that. It is supposed to be any habitat that is important for their survival. So things like breeding grounds, or if there's a certain like body of water that is really important to that animal. So it's supposed to be things that are important to their future survival is what it's like termed as. But um, as we'll go into later, some of the changes that have been made to it kind of are using that kind of vague term to make it harder to designate critical habitat. So I think that the there's not very concrete um, determinations for critical habitat. And that's kind of what, why it's hard to get enough critical habitat um, designated for certain species. Great, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, if no one else any has any more questions, we'll move forward. All righty, thank you everybody. So now we're gonna talk about the ESA currently and going into the future. So, 
how just how effective is the Endangered Species Act? Well, 99% of species that are listed under the Endangered Species Act have avoided extinction, which is great. However, only 3% have actually recovered to the point of no longer being threatened or endangered and being delisted from the Endangered Species Act. So we found that simply putting these species on a list and recognizing that they are endangered fails to actually start to recover them and it takes more efforts beyond that. And there are some issues associated with the Endangered Species Act. One of them is that um, this is sort of a limit, I guess you would call it on an issue, is that the Endangered Species Committee, also known as the God Squad, can exempt a species from protection. For example, if the economics, uh, economic benefits of a certain project or development exceed the be benefits of protecting that species. So obviously that is going to limit the ability to protect certain species based on their discretion. And there are probably lots of laws or certain things that we could go into about the Endangered Species Act, but we're not going to go into all of them today. That is a topic for perhaps another time, but we uh, do have a little list of ways that we think maybe the Endangered Species Act could be improved. Um, so one of those things would be regularly monitoring systems to ensure long-term preservation or maybe creating incentives for private landowners so that it encourages them to comply with the preservation also, trying to focus on protecting entire habitats instead of specific species provides kind of a, a more holistic perspective to protecting a species and can often protect other species as well. So that is always a good way to go. As well as educating people about how to protect species under the Endangered Species Act, because as we saw with the quiz that M Michelle showed us, I think a lot of people might not know the answer to that question, and just they, although they want to help protect species, they're just not sure what they need to be doing. So that is one thing that we could do to improve the Endangered Species Act. And finally, trying to heighten enforcement of the provisions, because also, like you saw with the quiz, things like having your dog off leash on the beach, it's really, it's hard to enforce that because there just aren't people going around watching every single second, making sure that people are following those provisions. Uh, so we do have those lists of things that we think could be improved for the Endangered Species Act, but you can see this photo is probably the most well-known success story for the ESA, um, the bald eagle, which was brought back from the brink of extinction. So there are lots of success stories related to the Endangered Species Act, which Michelle will get into in a little bit. So next we're gonna talk about some recent changes that have occurred to the Endangered Species Act. There are lots of them. These are just some of them. In 2019, economic impacts were added to the consideration of listing decisions and habitat designations. So basically they're able to weigh the economic benefits of maybe not protecting a species or how much it would cost to protect them in deciding whether they should be listed or have the habitat designated. So this is not supposed to influence whether a species is listed. It was intended so that the public could understand the value of the species as like a monetary value of how important they are. But this is slightly controversial as many think that this will serve as an easy way to kind of excuse not protecting a species that maybe needs it. Also in 2019, threatened species were are no longer automatically protected from taking. And this would this differs from a 1975 amendment that established a blanket um, a blanket agreement that would protect threatened and endangered species equally from taking. But now each threatened species case is reviewed individually to see if taking should be prevented or not. And then another thing that occurred was limitations on critical habitat designation. So like I was mentioning, it's pretty vague about what exactly is critical habitat and how to designate it. So it's in 2019, there were sort of limitations put on that where it would place further emphasis on protecting the species and not the ecosystem as a whole. So only the critical habitat that applies specifically to the species or uh, just sort of less critical habitat than would be designated before. Also in 2019, there were restrictions put on the ability to protect species from the effects of climate change, which is definitely detrimental to 
recovery. And then finally in 2020, gray wolves were delisted after over 40 years of protection. And they should be monitored for the next five years, according to the Endangered Species Act to recur, ensure recovery. However, a lot of um, people were, a lot of people disagreed with the Fish and Wildlife's decision to have the wolves delisted. The Fish and Wildlife Service believed that the population of gray wolves have been stable enough to no longer need protection. However, many conservation groups have threatened to sue and have sued, including the Sierra Club and the Center for Biological Diversity, because they believe it is too early to delist the species. They claim that the Fish and Wildlife Service ignored the lack of historical habitat that wolves used to have compared to what they have now, and that they selectively combined wolf populations for analysis and disregarded new wolf populations in northeastern and western states as unnecessary to the survival and recovery of wolves in the Midwest, which were where they were originally threatened. So there's lots of controversy surrounding this delisting, um, as well as all of these other changes that have been made. So now we get into maybe what is going to happen in the future. And obviously, there's no way to tell what will happen. But these recent changes will most likely cause an increased difficulty of getting species listed. Um, because of the economic impacts being added and also the changes that occurred involved speeding up and easing the permit process for development. So um, a lot of things are favoring development over protecting species, and it will probably also limit protections and recovery efforts that can be made for these species. So if these trends continue, we may see an even lower effectiveness of recovery through the Endangered Species Act. However, Hopefully, if these decisions are um, reviewed and possibly taken back, if they are not appropriate, then we might see a better future for the Endangered Species Act. So a little um, hope for the Endangered Species Act is that on the first day of his presidency, Joe Biden announced that his administration would review the recent rollbacks of the Endangered Species Act. So as many of them were controversial, hopefully we'll get a um, full and thorough of review to see if those are or should be in place. And the, Biden has also announced America the Beautiful plan to conserve at least 30% of the nation's lands and waters by 2030, which as we were mentioning, if we're protecting habitat, then we are going to be protecting species. It's inevitable. So hopefully Biden and future administrations will, as I said, review these changes and possibly even work to improve the Endangered Species Act so that we can fight the extinction crisis. All right, so next we're going to talk about a little bit of the success stories that we've had for the Endangered Species Act. So Michelle, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. So we're going to be going over two specific species. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? Yes. This is the island fox, and there are several species named after the specific islands on the Pacific coast. They were listed as endangered in the ESA in 2004, and it was delisted in 2016. There were many protections from the ESA, which included captive breeding programs, golden eagle relocations, bald eagle reintroductions, and efforts to remove feral pigs. This is wild, widely known as an ESA success story, as they are still under federal protection and there's a vaccination program that has been initiated to battle the diseases. Could we go on to the next slide, please? Thank you. This is the California brown pelican, and it was listed as endangered in 1970 in the Species Preservation Act. And as the Endangered Species Act was created, it was transferred from the Species Preservation Act to the Endangered Species Act, and it was delisted in 2009. The reason this species was threatened, because DDT, which is a pesticide, um, flowed in from the mainland to the sea, and it disrupted uh, reproductive systems and thinned the calcium in bird eggs, which caused them to crack before they can hatch. DDT fortunately it was banned in 1972 by the EPA. And although it was delisted, there are still some modern concerns of commercial fishing, which harms this species. The decline of sardines 
which um, the brown pelican heavily relies on, is decreasing because of overfishing. And the fish oil from waste separation, um, sorry, the fish oil from waste such as offal separates the feather barbules and it causes hypothermia. All right. And then before we go on to the importance of humans, we did get a few questions so we can answer them quickly before we go on. Um, somebody asked if that if hunting is allowed for the gray wolves again, and it is. I didn't mention that before, sorry. But yes, that is another reason why it's controversial is because many people don't believe these populations are ready to be hunted again. But yes, the hunting is now allowed for during hunting seasons. Um, and then also, Michelle, somebody was asking how, um, if you could expand on the other animals that were managed and how that impacted the island fox, because I know you talked about like feral pigs. So if you know anything about how, oopsies, how those helped the recovery of the island fox, do you know that? Um, so I believe the feral pig is, um, there is an overpopulation and they are causing harm to the fox because they're um, hunting too many of them. And with the golden eagle and bald eagle, the golden eagle, I believe is also, um, they hunt the island foxes. And the bald eagle reintroduction um, balances out the food chain to make this population more balanced. Awesome, thank you. Alrighty, so now we're going to talk about how it's important to humans. We talked about species that were impacted in good and bad ways. And now we'll talk about how this Endangered Species Act impacts us. So as I mentioned before, we are going through an extinction crisis. And the UN reported in 2019 that 1 million plant and animal species are at risk of extinction. So, and about 75% of land is severely altered due to human activity. So we are seeing a lot of problems with extinction of species, sadly. And all of this biodiversity loss, it affects the entire ecosystem when we lose biodiversity. And that includes us since we are part of the ecosystem. However, many people often do not understand the full effects of losing these species and how it impacts us until they're gone. So to give you kind of an idea of what exactly um, biodiversity and functioning ecosystems give to us, I have a list of ecosystem services. And ecosystem services are basically any positive benefit that wildlife or ecosystems provide to humans. So there's a lot of them and many that people don't realize is that ecosystems that are fully functioning and nice and diverse and full of um, lots of species will provide resources to us like food, water, wood, fuel, material for clothes and medicinal opportunities. They also regulate the climate. They clean the air and clean the water and they limit erosion and they also cycle necessary nutrients like phosphorus or nitrogen. And then some non-material benefits are recreational activities, you know, lots of like um, boating or fishing or something like that is provided by the ecosystem. It also impacts culture in a lot of ways. People associate nature to their culture in many different ways. And it also stimulates creativity. Um, from architecture to writing to photography, things like that. And it also aids mental health. Um, we also, we have actually an article on our blog if you wanted to see the benefits of nature on mental health. It was a really interesting article. We also have another article about ecosystem services in more detail if you wanted to see that. So just to give you some statistics about that, about 70% of cancer medication is derived from nature. That shows all of the medicinal benefits we get from nature. And about 235 to 577 billion US dollars of agriculture is dependent on pollination. So those pollination species like bees um, are really important and we're seeing a decline of them, but they're very important to these ecosystem services that we have. So that just shows you how important protecting all of these species are to humans, not just to the species themselves. And here in this picture, we have OC Habitats members enjoying a hike, enjoying nature at the Santiago Oaks Regional Park. All right, and then I'll turn it over to Michelle to talk about 
the holidays that are occurring recently. <laughs> Thank you. So the International Biodiversity Day falls on March 22 this year, which is today. <laughs> and it was created by the United Nations in 1993 to increase the understanding of biodiversity and to raise awareness on its importance. The theme for this year is that we're part of the solution, which is a continuation of last year's theme, which is our solutions are in nature. This means that um, climate changes, health issues, such as the pandemic this year, sustainability, biodiversity, security of resources, such as food and water, is our only way of life on the planet Earth, and it needs to be protected. The Endangered Species Day on March. Oh, yeah, this is May, sorry. Um, the Endangered Species Day is on May 21st, which was yesterday. And it was created by the US Senate in 2006 to raise awareness of different news regarding endangered species, um, as well as the importance of conservation and restoration. The theme for this year is Wildlife Without Borders which means that the habitat of animals and different species are not defined by national borders and their survival depends solely on our roles of humans working together. Um, you can celebrate these holidays by keeping yourself and others around you educated. And there, um, it's mainly celebrated online due to our situations this year, but there are a couple of um, public events that you can, um, go to, um, and it's in Orange County. I think that is the end All of our right. slides. Awesome. So, um, Michelle, do you have um, information on those uh, events? If you want to pull that up and maybe put a link in the chat, that would be okay, sure. great. I will definitely put that in the chat. All right. So yes, that is what we have for you guys today. Thank you guys so much for listening. Um, if you want to learn more, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at OC Habitats. And you can visit our website, which will also have our blog with the things that I was mentioning before. So now you guys can, you know, turn on your cameras, unmute your mics, and we can have a discussion about what we talked about today, about the Endangered Species Act, Endangered Species, anything pertinent to this coffee and conservation. Um, and we hope that you guys have a happy International Biodiversity Day and Endangered Species Day, and that you keep all of this in mind, um, educating and volunteering and trying to do what you can to help. But yes, thank you guys so much for listening. Does anybody have any questions about what we went through? Um, can you guys expand on, you talked about the fish oil with the brown pelican. I wasn't, I wasn't 100% clear on where the fish oil is coming from and how it's getting on the pelican. Okay, so yeah, definitely. Um, a lot of commercial fishing produces waste as they like clear the parts of fish that are unwanted or they often leave like unwanted fish outside. And because they, the brown pelicans don't have much to eat, they scavenge through the waste and try to find things to eat. And that's where the fish oil um, gets stuck to their feathers. Thank you. Any other questions? Jenny, did uh, you have a question that I cut you off on earlier? No, I, I, I was just looking and reading um, all the different things <laughs> that are here. So yeah, lots, it's a lot to take in. <laughs> yeah, I, on, the, on the brown pelican, um, you know, it did get delisted in 2009 and I did a bunch of research on it myself too. Um, and they are, it is actually showing a decline again, but not enough to be um, put back on the list. And, you know, it's interesting to me when something gets delisted that it opens it up to everything, right? It's one thing to say, okay, it doesn't need the same protections it needed before. Um, but when you um, delist something, and this goes jumping over from pelican to the, to the gray wolves is allowing hunting. It's like, okay, it's one thing to let them, you know, okay, we're incidental take that happens accidentally or whatever, but to actually allow and promote hunting, I, I find that 
contradictory to what we're doing. It just seems like, oh, we fixed it now, go ahead and mess it up again, then we'll have to fix it again. So it just seems like a interesting cycle. I'd love to hear someone else's um, perspective on that because that's how I feel about it. I'm curious if someone else has a different perspective or. I agree, absolutely. And I'm also sort of alarmed that they're only monitoring the situation for five years. That's like a drop in the bucket. That's like nothing. And you could, you know, a tiny downward trend might happen in that time and they say, oh, it's no big deal, but it's going to be continued for 10, 20, 30 years and you end up right back where you started. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. It seems like possibly there should be like an intermediate stage, whether or not maybe listed as threatened or endangered, but they're still being protected from certain things and monitored more closely for a longer time. That is possibly maybe an improvement that could be made. I don't know if anybody has any other any other thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. It, it should be more of a stepping down process instead of a jumping off, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you get delisted, but then you, just like you get escalated up the ladder, you should get de-escalated down the ladder instead of getting thrown off the ladder. Um, you know, cause I do think, and I think the amount of time is super important and it's very dependent on the species, right? Some species take longer to reproduce. And I feel like that five year time frame I think is more related to plants um, because they can produce rather quickly and you can see potential change in five years in a plant, but you may not be able to see that in an animal with reproduction, depending on their gestational periods, um, food resources, et cetera. So I, I agree with Susie that it should be, um, you know, maybe it's dependent on the species and, you know, they need to take a better look at five years. It's just this blanket amount of time that just, I don't think addresses every, every species that well. It probably doesn't even address half the species that well. That's a good point. Jane, Jane, you want to say yeah, yes, I do have a question. So I don't know if you know the answer to this, but um, who, who is the EPA, who, who are the EPA? Are these um, appointed positions by whichever administration is in power? Are they, are they um, civil servants that just come up through the ranks? Because I'm obviously, you know, how, whoever's making the decisions, if somehow or another we can affect and put people into positions, decision-making positions who are supporting um, the animals, then this will, cha this will change and, and changing it from the top down as opposed to from all of us on the bottom, like trying to fight and say, no, no. And then, but if the decisions come from the top down, it seems like that would be a, a maybe a, another way of, of facilitating changes to help these animals. Definitely, definitely. Did you mean the, the ESA? Yeah, who, yeah, so who, yeah, who, yeah. who are, who does, who are the people who the EPA, are deciding the this? Environmental yeah, protection who's the EPA, yeah. Yeah, the yeah, who's the EPA or, the, yeah, who are the people that are making the decisions for these? Are these appointed? And the answer to that are we is just yes, gonna be they are appointed, Jenny. They, I don't know if you were, okay. were following the Trump administration because he pulled in Last year, last his during his term, he pulled in someone that they many kind of labeled as anti environment. So that was a big controversial thing. So they okay, are appointed by the president, um, the top layer, right? Okay, so, okay. okay. But the, the this agency would be run by kind of just like State Department civil right. servants, and a lot of people left the EPA because he appointed this oil executive who didn't believe in the mission of the EPA, not to get political, but it was a right, thing. right. And a lot of the people who've had years of experience left and wouldn't work under him, and you can't blame right. them, you know? So yeah, it's right. a combination. Okay. It's a complicated a combination, yeah. Okay, so because I'm, I'm wondering, is this, are we, are we looking at a future of, um, if the administration is leaning this way, then everything's going to be taken away. And now the administration is leaning this way. So for four years, it's going to go this way. Then it's, and then we're just going to end up being like going back and forth and back and forth until um, I guess enough education, I don't know, or enough, whatever swings us either one way or the other way for more than just four years at a time or eight years at a time. Yeah, um, I actually I, think that is what's happening, um, Jenny, is it yeah. swinging back and forth with the, with the political climate, unfortunately, it's become a political thing instead of a, you know, a science thing or a nature thing or whatever. And it would be nice. I, you know, sometimes I think there's certain things that, that the, 
um, general public should be voting on, you know, and I think when it comes to the environment, I think maybe that's something that the entire country should be, you know, that should be put on a ballot so that all everyone can have a voice in that because it affects everyone. It just, you know what I mean? Um, all right. That no, yeah, I, I, I love that idea. That happening is probably pretty, pretty minuscule. <laughs> <laughs> and right. another thing so, people can do is write their Congress people because Congress does have to approve these appointments. Now, we know that the California Congress people, I don't always write to them because they're usually in agreement with how I'm looking at something. But if they're not, that's one really call or write email sign petitions. It doesn't do a lot, but it at least lets them know what the ground up opinion is. Right. I right. Right. The time. So uh, even though I agree with you, Susie, that every time, you know, they're kind of on the same page as me, but I still think it's just a good habit to get into is, you know, we really is to voice it. Right. So, so yeah. um, on a, on a local level, um, I just received something from, I think it was coast keepers that um, the city of Newport beach, so I guess that it comes down to, we need to act locally um, because we really can't, you know, I wish that we could just, you know, wave a magic wand and, and, uh, make changes but uh the city of newport beach apparently is uh deciding their environmental report for the whole newport bay are you familiar with this stacy i actually saw it. it's it, i think it's specific in newport harbor yeah newport um, harbor that's it it's, it's sure used it's the entire city because i know they have other things going on in newport that you know if it were a whole city thing it would include a lot of things but i didn't read through it fully so i know that they're about to dredge that area um, so I'm not hundred percent sure what exactly, if it's just a, th this is the time to do it. Like, oh, it's there. I think they, a lot of times there's a period, like a five or seven year period that they have to, you know, look back mm -hmm. at what they have and, you know, update it. it. It might simply be that, but I did see some pushback. It looks like people might not right. be happy with what they're proposing. So, right. So I, I guess that's what we have left. We can, we can try, uh, the, the, in, um, the endangered species, hopefully by our local action, will prevent endangered species from being, you know, at a, a state or a federal level. And I mean, we can hope for a good administration, but we can't always, that might not always happen, but we can act locally at least. And that, that makes me feel like I have at least some power <laughs> as opposed to feeling completely powerless and just like, okay, well, that's what they decided. Right. And I can't really do anything about it. I struggle with even locally a little bit because um, some of these species that we, you know, we want to try to protect are migratory. You know, they don't stay in one place, right? They, they, they go between different cities, different counties, sometimes even different states and different countries. So it's hard to how do you, you know, yes, we can protect them here, but as soon as they leave from here, they're not protected anymore. So it's right. 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 So I, I, I don't know. I, I wish, I wish we could all be, you know, I think that's why it's important to have a global oversight committee um, looking at our planet in overall, because it's, you know, the web is much deeper than they, you know, and more intricate than many people even, you know, assume. And, uh, you know, we just, and I, and I agree with you hundred percent, got to do it locally. You know, if we didn't do it, then nothing's going to happen, but. Right. Just, just and, and I think that, I think that also that what we're doing, uh, OC Habitats, what we're doing is important because um, at the, at the, at the base of all of this is education. So what Gina and Michelle are doing today is helping to educate all of us and making us more aware of um, you know, where the, the weaknesses and the strengths are in, in the law, but um, what we can do, you know, maybe we can act locally or just to, just to be more aware, just to be more aware of what's going on is important. Even if we don't do anything, at least we have some awareness. Yeah. And I think that makes a huge difference, right? I, I, oh, I, I think being aware of what's around you. I mean, I, whenever we do education programs, um, adults and students alike, we get oh, I didn't know that. And, you know, all of our volunteers that are with OC Habitats, you know, always come to me and say, I see things differently than I used to see them. Um, and, and hopefully they see it in a way that they enjoy it more because they're seeing, oh, there's all these different species here and this is someone's home. And although they have to be more careful, they're also realizing there's a lot of life here, you know, beyond mm -hmm. us. So, mm -hmm. yes. So that, I agree with you 100%. Awareness and education are, you know, that's why it's the foundation of OC Habitats, right? So, 
So does um, anyone have anything, any other questions they or any comments they want to make about this? Um, all good. <laughs> Everybody's ready to have their day. It's a beautiful day outside, I think. So um, yeah, thank you everybody so much for coming and for discussing with us. We had a great discussion today. So thank you guys so much for contributing and listening. Um, but yes, enjoy your day and we will see you next time. Bye guys. Thank you.